Only if I close my eyes, this whole thing will go away. What a rotten I thought you'd dearly love the good hoedown. Yeah, with people, but God, I heard a buffalo. Oh. <laughs> of it later, but right now we got something more important. Hey, Marshal! I guess my dance is pretty rusty, Mr. Wishbone. Well, you dance yourself right into that supply wagon and get that surprise I made. Oh, yes, sir. Surprise? The thing I made this morning, you idiot. Now, come on, bring some boxes down here. We'll make a table. What's the problem, Wish? It's too soon for Christmas. Is it for all of us? No, it's not for all of us. It's for Mr. Rowdy Ramrod Yates. Me? Yeah, that's right. Couldn't wishbone book. It's your birthday, boy. Yes, sir. I'm the cook and the nursemaid in the county courthouse around here. All right, everybody, let her rip. He's a jolly good fellow. He's a jolly good fellow. He's a jolly good fellow. I don't know what to say, except because if it wasn't for Wishbone, we'd all forget we were ever born. <laughs> I figure he deserves the first piece. Sorry to interrupt your festivities. Anything I can do for you, mister? Well, something, someone. We have business with one of your men. It's private business. Well, it's been a long time, Cabot. Tell me. Oh, not too long. Long enough to finish what's between us. Well, there's nothing to settle. Nothing to begin with. What do you think there was? You might as well face it. We spent a lot of time tracking you down. We won't leave till it's settled. Take a choice, Yates. Settle now, or get used to the idea of living with ghosts you can't bury. Jesus, get my horse, will you? If you say so, senor. Well, Mr. Roddy, your cake. I forget it, much. What's it all about? That's an old problem. My business. You don't have to be. Just say the word. Now, this is one of those things I gotta do alone. Well, if you do need any help, you know where we are. Well, like I said, gentlemen, forgive me for interrupting your party. Let's go. We ought to send somebody after him? Well, whatever it is, the man says he wants to go it alone. You ride all night for this? There's others gonna meet us here. Thought about this a long time, haven't you, Kevin? Six years, Yates. Six long years. Inside. Yates. 
Not up there. Not down here. But you want the truth, Cabot. Truth is the trial of itself. You know, with the 44 as the judge and jury, huh? You won't get any answers out of a dead man, or the ghosts of a dead town, for that matter. Answers, Yates? Yeah. There's only one answer. You're looking at it. <laughs> I might ask you the same question, sir. You gentlemen are trespassing. A ghost town? Here, most of all, sir. With such infinite privacy, the slightest transgression is greatly attenuated. You still haven't answered my question. Who are you? Alexander Langford, sir. At your service. gentlemen, my world, my town, my home. Hmm. And probably very soon, my grave. I was a judge, sir, and before that a lawyer. This is where I defended my clients and sat in judgment. These clients of yours, Mr. Langford, where are they? Gone, my friend. Scattered like leaves in a windstorm. Something to do with mine failure, as I recall. But you came back. Life's but a summer, sir. Man, little more than a flower, he dies. How soon he dies. For me, better here when I know what I am. So you see, sir, ghosts and I have much in common. And you're just the man we need. Yates, you said you wanted a trial. You got it. We even got ourselves a judge. You misunderstood, sir. I no longer have the authority to hear cases. Or the desire. In a dead town, I'm afraid that authority is only a word. As for desire, I'm certain that we can find a way to change your mind. Don't! I knew you'd change your mind, judge. Now, you just get back up on that bench and make yourself comfortable. It won't be long. <laughs> should be along any time now. much of a judge, does he? Make any difference? Your friends. They're not here yet? I'll tell you when, Your Honor. I don't think I've had the honor, sir. Name's Yates, Rowdy Yates. I don't suppose you're interested why I'm here. You don't suppose correctly, sir. Your name is all I'll need. Unmarked graves always did disturb me. Is he here? Inside. And we'll need this. Well, how are you, Cal? Uh, 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 uh. No, it's all right. You look fine, Cal.
That man. What's wrong with that man? Same thing as the matter with Cabot. Only with him, you can see it. waiting around. Ain't that right, Yates? Ah, oh, not yet. We're still one short. Anyway, we're gonna have a trial. We have ourselves a real bona fide judge over there. The best that whiskey can buy. Just the kind of man to see that we don't break any laws. After all, we couldn't have Yates here saying that his judgment day was illegal, could we? No, we couldn't have that. Gentlemen, please, you'd better proceed without me. You see, I have no robes. We don't stand on ceremony, Judge. You just get back to your little bench. Yeah, but my robes... Now! Well, Judge? This court is now in session, and I must remind you that certain formalities must be observed. Save the speeches, Langford. Let's get this done. As long as I'm acting judge here, sir, I must insist on due process of law. You're absolutely right, Judge. Due process of law. It's the way we want it, isn't it? Very well. You may proceed. The court martial of Private Rowdy Yates, Confederate States of America, is now in session. Court martial? But the Confederacy ceased to exist six years ago. You have no authority, sir. Like I said, Judge, in a dead town, authority is just a word. On the board of the court martial, Corporal Leslie Bellamy, CSA. Private Samuel Jordan, CSA. Corporal Cal Mason, CSA. Captain Francis Cabot, CSA. The prisoner will come forward and hear the charges. General charged and honor about August 15th in the year 1864 on the Union prisoner of war camp at Yuma. Private Yates did perform an act of treason against the Army of the Confederacy. Specific charge number one. The Private Yates did willfully betray to the Union camp commander an escape plan. Number two, the Private Yates betrayal resulted in the death of two men, Privates Quintle and Burke. Number three, the Private Yates betrayal resulted in the paralysis of Corporal Cal Mason. Well, Judge? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. <laughs> there will be order in this court, if you please. As you say, Judge. We can't have anyone held in contempt now, can we? With your permission, the prosecution will begin the case. You may proceed. The first witness will be Private Samuel Jordan. What's that for? The beginning, Judge. It all started with this, the deadline. That's where we first met Yates. We'd all been captured, all of us, the captain, the whole third platoon. And they marched us to this muckle they called a prison camp. 5,000 men jammed in a stockade so tight you couldn't even squat. It was about as high as that wall. And every 50 feet, there was a guard with a rifle pointed down. And on the ground, about 10 feet in front of the wall, was this, this line. 
In between the stockade poles, there were gaps. We were all walking toward them. Because we wanted to look out. Grass and trees. Anything green and grown and alive. Hey, Yates comes in on his push and his back. That's what a deadline is. You cross it, you're dead. That's right, and you would have been dead too, all of you, if I hadn't stepped in. Right behind him comes Major Holbrook. You and Holbrook. Always at the same time in the same place. Holbrook? The camp commander. We called him the butcher from Boston. Ah, you men are lucky. New men have to learn the hard way. Oh, I can cross this line because my uniform is blue. Ah, you're not confined to any one area. You are free to roam at will. Square yard apiece to walk in. And if you are injured, you will be given hospital care. Where you will promptly die. Now, when you first met Private Yates, he saved your lives. Your Honor, must be mighty thirsty work asking all those questions. Yes, Captain. Mighty thirsty. That's right, Cabot. Don't let him ask any of the wrong questions. You wanted a trial. You're getting it. Did you hear that, Judge? He said this is a trial. He hates. Don't push too hard. Bellamy, you're forgetting. Due process of law. Now let him talk. Yeah, let him talk, but just don't listen. Don't interfere with their thinking. Mr. Yates, you must try to understand. I cannot influence my own thinking, much less than other man's. Look, Langford, I ain't one of your ghosts. You stick me and I bleed. Now, you didn't have to be a part of this thing, but as long as you've gone along and, and you're behind that bench, it's got to mean something to you. Yates is right, Your Honor. This is a trial. Look, you brought him into this thing, Cabot. Now let him decide what the truth is, will you? Fine, we'll let him decide. I'm just not one to see a man suffer, that's all. Go on, Judge, put out the fire. <sighs> Private Jordan, you may continue. Well, after that first day, Private Yates showed us the ropes. He taught us how to live in that stinking camp. And then we started talking about escape. And the first plan was his idea. The first plan? Yeah, there, there were two attempts to escape. What was the first? The coffin route. Coffin route? You want to tell it, Captain? No. No, Jordan, that's Mason's story. Your turn now, Cal. Now listen to me. You nod when I say things are right and shake your head when I don't. You got that? These were my men. All of them. And they weren't going to rot like the rest of them. Not while I was there, Captain. The others were dying like flies. The Blue Jacks had us cart them off in wheelbarrows, box them up, and dump them in these long graves. Now, when things were at their worst, that's when Yates got his idea. It was our plan, all of us. You're not on the witness stand yet, Mr. Yates. It's all right, Judge. Let him tell the story his way. All right. The, uh, Holbrook, he had me uh, on this detail of building these coffins out of pine, sort of like these. Well, there was about 20 deaths a day in that prison, sometimes a few more and sometimes less. When there was less, there would be coffins left over. The, the empty coffins, they were the way out. Yates thought so. He wanted us to climb into the empty boxes, get hauled out, and get buried. He said you could split the top of the coffin with your fist. The grave was shallow. All you had to do was climb out. I was willing to be buried alive to try it out. All of us were. You had to have it your own way. It was my decision to make. So you sent along Mason along to test it. If it all gone, we'd all be dead. Gentlemen, please. This is still a court of law. I implore you, we must have order. Who are you to implore anything? Bellamy, now, my apologies, Judge. Oh, he's right. We agreed that one should go. We agreed it was for the best. 
You understood that now, didn't you, Cal? Exhibit B. Captain, do you have to do that? <laughs> no, Cal, trust me now. Trust me. I said that to him then. Cal, trust me, you'll be free and well. Anyway, we hammered him in. The work detail came. Yates had the coffin stacked up on the grave carts, and then they took him out. What happened was an accident. Or was it Yates? The horses took him out. Now, when he came back, three men were carrying him. And he was like he is right now, half paralyzed, unable to speak. What happened? It was dark and the horses were skittish. One of them shied and the coffins fell off the wagon. The wagon ran over two of the coffins. Mason was in one of them. You wanted him caught. You were afraid he'd get away and you wouldn't. You did that! Bellamy! Captain, we can't leave him in there. All right, get him out. The coffin served its purpose. Right, Judge? The paths of glory lead but to the grave. No coffin has served its purpose, Captain. Not until its four walls quiet the troubling of the wicked and deaden the din of the weary. Robert Burns was one to say there's courage in Mr. Barleycorn. What I need right now doesn't come in a bottle. Mm. What's holding them up? A witness named Quintal. Quintal? Quintal's dead. Look, look Langford, I, I guess you know you're the only one who can help me out. Help you? <laughs> there is no heaven. There is no hell. These be the dreams of baby minds. This is my hell, Mr. Yates, and my master. I cannot even help myself. And what are you doing here? Hmm, curiosity. <laughs> Probably compassion. Compassion? For me or for you? Conscience, Mr. Yates, is God's presence. And man, that luxury I lost long ago, thanks to this. I was a lion among men, a tiger on the high wire of justice. I would have fought for you then, but not now. No. This is the end of a long road for me. I didn't sell those men out. They never taste to always drink. They always talk. You'll never think. So said Brutus, and so said Judas. Langford, I'm not guilty. Yeah, words, my dear sir. Words. I no longer hear them. I no longer believe them. I was a boy. And then a lawyer. And it seemed there was no time in between. Finally, I became a judge. The youngest in three states and two territories. Then one day, they brought in this young cowboy. He was accused of killing a man for the man's wife. 
But the evidence was circumstantial. The jury argued it out for two days, and then it was up to me to decide for them, one way or the other. I looked into that boy's soul, and I saw innocence. So I told them, and they let him go. Three days later, he killed the woman too. From that day on, the law ceased to exist for me. I cut it out and dissolved it in alcohol. Well, the man who refuses to remember the past sometimes condemned to repeat it. You want me to help you. Where do you think I'd find that much courage? Where it used to be. Still is, maybe. I said I would play a part. A clown. A buffoon. A play actor. On a stage of sand. That's how it has to be. It's not enough, Langford. If you won't cut me free, then you're gonna have to judge me. You'll have to stand behind that judgment. Not behind the bottle. Why did they have to bring you here? Why couldn't it have been somewhere else? They didn't bring me here. I came willingly. See, this thing ended once and for all. Ended? I saw eternity the other night, like a great ring. A pure and endless light. Nothing ends, Mr. Yates. Except hope. your bench, back to your bottle. Mrs. Quintle, it's so good of you to have come. I had to. It was my duty, Captain Gavin. Private Rowdy Yates. That was from my husband. Judge? You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Court calls as a witness Mrs. Agnes Quintle, wife of the deceased Private Joshua Quintle. Mrs. Quintle, as I told you when we talked last month, we seek our own justice in our own way, so you may speak as you will. And who is he? Now, he's a judge. He's agreed to preside for us. I suppose that is the proper way. I don't know you. Not by your face, nor the way you speak. Only by your actions. And ever since Joshua died, I've kept myself alive, knowing that someday I would see you. And I'd watch you die with that around your neck. Uh, Mrs. Quintle, you obviously are aware of the charges against the defendant. Have you anything to add to the case against him? Yes. A letter. A forged letter. Supposedly from my husband, but actually written by Private Yates. Do you know of this letter, Private Yates? Yeah, I know of it. Why does Mrs. Quintle refer to it as a forgery? Uh, because Quintle's hands were injured. 
He asked me to write the letter in his place. It's all right there. That proves it was a forgery. Quintal never hurt his hands. Uh, Captain Cabot, uh, this letter is admitted as evidence, but I don't understand. Uh, forgery or otherwise, what actual bearing does it have? Another link in the chain, another knot in the noose. He lied about the letter. He's lying about the betrayal. How did Private Quintal die? After our first escape attempt failed, we just wrote it off as bad luck. Then we began searching for another plan. We came up with a tunnel. Tunnel? An escape tunnel. It was to go from the floor in our shed across several feet of yard and then up underneath the stockade wall. It took us three months, three months to dig that tunnel. We clawed at that dirt with whatever we had at our disposal, with sticks, with pieces of iron, with our hands. Before we were finished, Yates here was committed to the infirmary. When we were ready, I went to him and told him that we were leaving that night. And what did Private Yates have to say? He couldn't say much because he was too sick, but I knew that we couldn't bring him along with us, so I told him that we were going to leave without him. Major Holbrook's men were waiting. Private Quintal was killed. Private Burke was killed. And the rest of us spent the remainder of the war in solitary. In other words, Captain, you're saying that because you wouldn't wait and take Yates with you, he told Holbrook what you were planning. That's the charge. Now all that's left is the verdict. Verdict, sir? Aren't you rushing things a little, Captain? After six years, man's patience is honed down as thin as it can get. Captain, a point of law. It would not be fitting to hang the man until we've heard him speak. Besides, Mrs. Quintal has a question. It should be answered. The bench calls the defendant, Private Yates. Now tell us what happened, Private Yates, the way you saw it. Captain, we have to listen to all this. It's his right. I would like to hear what he has to say. All right, Mrs. Quintal. By all means, Yates, speak up. Just don't keep us too long. That's all I can do for you. Yeah. Well, you see, this tunnel he, he's talking about it was cold and it was damp, and we always had to worry about the thing caving in. I got this fever first, and so Cabot had Quintal take me to the infirmary. And that's where Quintal met Ruth Cogan. Ruth Cogan? This name hasn't been mentioned before. I'm sorry it has to be mentioned at all. We're gone. Well, I'd like to ask Cabot a question. When was it that you and the others tried to make your escape? Mid-October. Take a look at the date on that letter, Judge. October the 18th. Every letter that went out of that prison camp, had to go through Holbrook, and that took at least two weeks. I mailed that letter on the first part of October. That was two weeks before Quintal was killed. Two weeks before Cabot told me that he was gonna have to leave without me. Well, go on, Mr. Yates. Bellamy, who was it that was always visiting me up there at the infirmary, keeping me informed on what was going on? Quintal? I don't see where this is leading us, Mr. Yates. Well, maybe to the truth about a nurse named Kogan who was friendly to all of us, maybe a little too friendly. You're reaching, Yates, a nurse who never existed, a rainbow on a rainy night. Won't work. I'm not reaching, Cabot. She existed, all right. Especially for Quindle. Simple enough. He thought he was in love with her. No, that's not true. He, he didn't love her. She was just a friend. Oh. And this Ruth Cogan did exist. Well, it was in his first letter. Joshua talked about visiting the infirmary, and he said he met this woman. 
And he said that she reminded him of me. And she was kind to him. She was just a friend. He pulled out a strong back, but inside he was scared and lonely. He reached out for this woman, and she let him. He hung on, that's all there was to hang on to. Oh, Joshua loved me. Yeah, but you weren't there, and he needed someone. Joshua wrote you a letter telling you all about me and the girl, but I begged him not to send it, telling him that as soon as he got out of here, everything would be the same as it always was. He wouldn't listen to me. But I never got such a letter. Right, because I burned it. I sent that one in its place, so you'd never have to know. Joshua always was like a little boy. He was afraid of being alone. He should have known that I would... I would have understood. I would have forgiven him. All right, so Quiddle may have made a mistake, but it has nothing to do with Yates' guilt. Maybe it does, Cabot. A man like Quindle, desperate and lonely. Suppose he tells the Kogan woman about the escape plan. Suppose he tells her to meet him later on, huh? We're not supposing here, Yates. We're looking for facts. Jordan, Bellamy, think back on that night. What was Quindle acting like? What was he saying, huh? Well. Come on, Bellamy, spit it out. Kevin wants to hear it, don't you, Captain? There was, there was one thing. We were crawling through the tunnel, and Quindle kept muttering something about a light. It was after we had clawed through the last of the dirt and the brush. Quindle sort of half laughed and said, uh, she'll be waiting, something like that. Then all I remember are the shots. That still doesn't prove anything. You said that Joshua wrote you a letter when he first met the Kogan woman telling you about how she reminded him of you. Was kind to him. Don't you think maybe in his mind she was you? My dear Agnes, I'm glad to know that things are good and that your mother is well. You don't know how much I miss you. I love you more every day I don't see you. Your handwriting, Mr. Yates. And your words, written for a woman you never saw. Captain Cowart, you spoke of the verdict. You spoke of hanging the accused. But your evidence, it's not enough. To my mind, there is doubt. Considerable doubt. It could have been as the accused suggested. The verdict is still the same, Your Honor. Now, why don't you just retire to your chambers and have yourself a nice little drink while we settle this thing ourselves? Oh, no, Captain. Not until we've heard the last witness. The last witness? Captain Francis Cabot. Well, now, you're just borrowing time, Judge, and you're running out of credit. Primus in orbe, Deus Fica Timo. The voice of a dead language, Captain, spoken in a dead town. It was fear that first made gods in the world. What have you to fear? keeps a hate brewing for all these years. He builds it up and shapes it into a crusade. Why? There wasn't enough. Not for the trial. Not from the testimony I've heard. Nothing but a terrible war and the terrible deaths of friends. Or were they friends? They were more than friends. They were my men. My responsibility. And what are they now, Captain? Are these people still your responsibility? I am still their officer, if that's what you mean. He smelleth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. This war is only the ashes of dead memories to most men, but Captain Cavett is still your officer. Tell me, do you still salute? Do you still follow blindly? Without question or morality? This has gone far enough. What's the matter, Captain? You afraid to take a good look at yourself? 
The Confederacy was destroyed. You were an officer with no army, but you kept your war alive by creating an enemy, Private Yates. Through him and your own mantle of hatred, you kept your men together. A platoon to lead, a platoon to destroy. They needed me. Now you look at them. They couldn't have survived without me. Look at Mason. Where do you think he'd be without me? And Bellamy, and Jordan. I think for all of them. Just as you did when you wore a captain's gold and gray. No war, but you're still their officer. And they still need me. Wrong, Cabot, you need them. You need him so bad, you're willing to hang an innocent man just to keep him. One question, Captain Cabot. Who comes after Yates? Who's next? How long will you let him feed his hatred into you? Eat into your minds until it destroys you like it has him. How long? <laughs> Words, man. It's just the babblings of a drunken old man who hasn't got the courage to face himself. Much less life. Now, I say that we've listened long enough. It's time to carry out what we came here to do. For myself, I've enjoyed our little trial. It showed Yates up for what he really is. Corporal Bellamy, Private Jordan, you'll carry out the sentence. Captain, this is a court-martial. Remember? The prisoner is entitled to hear the verdict before sentence is carried out. You, Jordan. Bellamy. Mrs. Quintal. It's hard to give up, isn't it? But you'll get something in return. You, you'll get your freedom from him. The verdict, your verdict. Fools, cowards! You let Yates go after what he did to you. Very well. I'll carry out the sentence myself. On whom, Captain? On whom will you pass sentence? Langford, stay out of this. Oh, no, Mr. Yates. This is our judgment day now, not yours. The accused has been found not guilty. So that leaves me, doesn't it, Captain? Langford? He said a trial, justice, truth. Let's see if he can stare it in the face. Your gun, Captain. Your war is over. First a boy, then a lawyer, then a judge, and finally, a man. A man. I'm so sorry. That love far off, the thunder of the captain.
Honey. All night? The longest of my life. That uh, business in town, you get it straightened out? Oh, yeah, I'll straighten away. Any trouble? I'm back. Kitchen with her feet in the hall. Skip to my room, my darling. The dirty rats. The dirty low down rats. They done went and quit old Jim. That's what they did. Well, hold still. Hold still. He ain't saying today. You can buck old Jim off. Hey, skip, skip to my room. Skip, skip, skip to my room. Gentlemen, we have a new game tomorrow. Yeah. Well, we'll see you in the morning, Corey. Yeah. My horse is over the livery stable. Someone's been shot. It's Major Courtney. Major, but who wouldn't? Them drovers. Who else would have more reason to kill the Major? Get Devlin fast. I got a gal, nine feet tall. I got a gal, that ain't all. Sleeps in the kitchen with her feet in the hall. Stampede? Hey! Skip, skip to Well, if it ain't our little lost lamb. Hello. Oh, shut up, you fool. You wake up, Mr. Favor, we'll have to put you no, in bed with a spoon. Good old wishbone. You know he's half cook and he's half grim. <laughs> no. <laughs> you want a drink, Grandma? Yeah, give me the only drink. Yeah. All right, Jim, give me the bottle. No, he ain't, but get this little old bottle. I'll just take you all on. Oh, one punch quince. That's who I am. What do you think? Might as well. Either that or we're gonna have to take a board to him. Not too hard, Roddy. Uh, I hate to do this. Sweet dreams, killer. Come on, let's plant him under the tree. 
Punch, how's your jaw? I don't know, Roddy. I need where it hurts. Well, you might just as well kill him outright as to torture him to death. Sorry, no... Well, just sorry yourself to work and pick up that mess. Come on, let me through. Uh, let's see if I can get some of this down it. Oh, what's that? It was my own special concoctions. Never failed yet. Come on, Jim. <laughs> oh, you poisoned me. Well, it's no worse than that stuff you were drinking last night. What did you do? Lick the varnish off the bar top, too? All right, all right. What's holding you up? You should be moving. What well, wages this in? Uh, sour mash one. Throw them in a saddle, it'll wear off. Let's go! I swear, I don't think I can make it, Wish. Oh, come on. It isn't gonna kill you. That's what I'm afraid of. Tried to, you know. But uh, Quince was really going at it kind of strong. And they'll disappear. We couldn't find him anywhere. Much better. All the makings of a posse. What did we ever do in town last night, anyhow? Uh, nothing, nothing. Uh, I'm Ben Devlin, the sheriff of Cottonwood. Who's the trail boss? Gil Favor, right over there. You favor? That's right. Where's the rest of you, man? Not with the herd. What's it all about? There he is. Get him. Hey, you! Hold everything. You got the badge, use it. Uh, Mr. Favor, you're interfering with the law. Law ain't gonna take one of my men without a pretty good reason. Murder reason enough? Murder? The man killed Major Courtney. He shot him right in the back. You got proof of that? He had a fight with the Major in the Paradise Saloon. I saw the whole thing. Why, well, he'd have killed the Major right then if... Well, if he hadn't stopped him. That fight wasn't nothing. He couldn't have killed anybody. He was with us all the time. <laughs> Not after the fight. You took him outside and came back alone. He never came back. Yeah, but hold on now. I sure didn't kill nobody. Where'd you go? What'd you do? Uh, I don't know. Uh, did you see anybody or talk to anybody? That, that I don't remember. How could he remember anything? He was out on his feet. Well, how does he know it didn't kill the Major? Is that all the evidence you got? Well, it's enough for a trial. Well, it ain't enough for us. Well, now, Mr. Favor, you know as well as I do that, that I can take him in if it's only on suspicion. Well, if you don't surrender him, I swear I'll, I'll call in every marshal and peace officer in the territory. Well, that's right, Mr. Faber. No use bucking him. It'll just cause a lot of worse trouble. All right, Jim, you go along. I'll get this cleared up. Yes, sir. Don't worry, Jim. I'll just take this. All right, let's go. Favor. You stay out of Cottonwood. One killing ain't worth 12 more. Uh-huh. 
thinking about it already, eh? Get, getting all steamed up to go in and bust Quince out of jail. Well, the way they were setting up, maybe that's the only way we're going to be able to handle it. It's not the only way. I'm telling you right now, anybody goes into town, anybody tries to break Quince out of jail, I'll be right there alongside the sheriff. But he hadn't a chance, Mr. Favor. They say one thing, and he can't even tell them they're lying. He doesn't remember. Well, then I'll find out for myself what he did. And I don't need no army to do it. Joe, you go tell Clay to take over and bedding down the herd. The rest of you start bunching them up on the other side of the valley. Uh, I'm going with you. Only on the condition you keep that idiot thing put away. I thought we was in a hurry to get rolling. You just pick that stuff up. We're gonna lay over. Lay over? What for? Because Mr. Favor's got business in town. Business? What kind? Looks like hanging business. Was a big man around town. Was Rowdy, was. There's a strange feeling about this town. Like being in a thunderstorm with a herd about ready to explode. Mm. Hey. Real old timey gallows tree. Yeah, by the looks of it, they're getting ready to use it. Alice Ensign is both doing the same job. Why don't you nose around and see if you can find anybody you saw Quince after you lost him? All right, but I don't expect too much cooperation. Do what you can. Roddy. Hmm? One thing we got to face up to. What's that? Always a chance that Quince did do it. And I don't see you waiting for no judge. We all know that that... Talk to you when you got a minute, Sheriff. You were told to stay out of town. See, you always do your talking for you, Sheriff. Uh, Mr. Favor, the law talks for itself. As far as Major Courtney and your drove is concerned, Roy here had a perfect right to say his piece. He was the Major's foreman. I was more than that. Well, not more. I was the Major's friend. Well, Quince is my friend, so I'll have the same rights to that trial as you do then, huh? Well, that won't be until tomorrow, until the circuit judge gets here. Give me a little time to prepare Quince's case. <laughs> case? <laughs> he ain't got no case. We'll make real sure you do then. I'd better be getting to the funeral. But I'll be sticking around town, in case you might need some extra deputies. <laughs> uh, now, Mr. Fitch, as you say, you have a right to be at the trial. But that's all. Just exactly what do you have on my drover? Major Courtney's body was found in the alley between the livery stable and the Paradise Saloon. He was shot in the back. Your drover was seen coming out of the alley. And before that, he had a fight with the Major and swore he'd kill him. Well, that's it. Just like that? On circumstantial evidence? And you say that's it? Oh, no. A jury will decide that. Is that the same jury that strung up that noose outside? It don't strike me as being much of a trial, Devlin. Well, that's about all he can expect from around here. And the Major, well, he meant a lot to all of us. Well, Jim means a lot to us. You better start remembering what that badge stands for. Mr. Faber, the Major didn't have an enemy in this world. Well, he was this town. Well, he helped practically everybody here get his start. And without him... 
All anybody wanted to do was kneel down and wipe his boots. Nobody had a reason to do anything else. Nobody, that is, except your, your friend in there. Devlin, your job is to find the facts of the matter, not to sit in judgment. I'll see Jim now. Call me when you get ready to leave. You know, for a while there, I'd talk myself into believing this was just a bad dream, but now I know it ain't. How's it going? Oh, all right, I guess. One thing about it, it's, it's a lot better than wishbones cure, except I wouldn't give it to my worst enemy. Look, Mr. Faber, this has got to be just some tomfool mistake. They can't hold this on me, can they? A lot will depend on you, Jim. Try and remember now. Everything that happened last night. Well, I, uh, I remember going to the saloon with Rowdy and Joe and having a few drinks. What about the fight? Well, you know how it is. This fellow comes up to the bar next to me and makes me spill my drink. And he didn't apologize. I, I said something, he said something. The next thing I know, we just went to swing. He swung harder and faster, I guess. One of the witnesses swears that you was going to kill him. Well, that's, that's just talk. You know that. Is that all? Well, Roddy came in, busted things up. He pushed me outside and jabbed my head in the water trough. And then... Uh, yeah, where'd you go then? Well, I don't know. I, uh, next thing I remember is waking up in a stall on a pile of hay. A livery stable? Yeah. Must have passed out, I guess. Anyway, I went back to the saloon looking for Roddy and Joe. You go inside? No, I didn't. I looked in the window and, well, the place was almost empty. I didn't see any bar boys there. And, well, I figured it was late, so I went on back to camp. Is that all? Can't you remember anything else? Well, that's, that's about it. Oh, at livery stable. Did you see anyone there? No. I guess it don't add up to too much, does it? Oh. I'm afraid not. But at least it's something for us to work on. Yeah, sure, sure. It's mighty funny how things work out. It's not because I'm lily white, not by a long shot, you know that. I've had to be pushed back a few times. And... But to haul off and be hung for something you didn't... Is that him? Yeah. They're giving him a big send-off, ain't they? Seems like he was a pretty big man in this town. Well, cowboy, you're on a peck of trouble. horses and all the king's men couldn't put Courtney together again. That's not very appropriate, is it? Yeah, well, it depends on how you felt about it. Well, he was a fine man. I buy you a drink? Why don't you save your money, cowboy? You don't have to pay for the answers. I didn't know I got any questions. Well, now, you're a drover, aren't you, from the herd west of town? Yeah. Rowdy Yates, my name. I'm Della Locke. Come on. Sit down. Thank you. Didn't I see you here last night? Mm-hmm. You can see me here every night. I own the paradise. Oh. What's wrong with that? Another thing. So you don't often see uh, salons being run by a lady. Well, now, that's the nicest compliment I've had in years. I'll buy you a drink. What do you want? A beer. One beer. All right. Start asking. 
Well, if you get, uh, if you get some answers, then maybe you get the questions to go with them. There's only one that really matters, isn't it? About what I think about last night, about Major Courtney's death. Yeah, that'll do. Uh-huh. Well, not a thing. What'd you expect? That I'd clear your friend, that I'd say he didn't do it? You brought it up. Well, for what it's worth, I, um, I don't believe he did do it. Well, that's worth plenty. Not a red cent. You see, the people in this town don't care what anybody thinks. They loved Major Courtney, and he's dead. And somebody's gonna pay for it. Yeah, even if it means hanging the wrong man, huh? Well, now, they wouldn't know the difference. But you do. I only said believe, Mr. Yates. Oh, no. Not without something to go on. You know, so far, you're the only one in this town who's given Quince half a chance. Got to be a reason for that. Well, now, let's just say that I, am. Uh, I don't like to run with the crowd. Mm-hmm. Any other answers I can, don't have to pay for you? Nothing comes free, cowboy. I need my funeral. A little careless with the company you keep, ain't you? Well, now, this place is open for the public, and it's going to stay that way. You're talking back, Della. The major wouldn't like that. Neither do I. The scenery changes, Roy, but people remain the same. You're still just a nickel and dime errand boy to me. Better watch your temper, mister. It's bad for the digestion. So is a bullet in the back. What you waiting for, cowboy? You want me to turn around? Some, it's hard to tell the back from the front. Are you a friend of his? Hello. Oh, yeah, him. He's my buddy. She took your time getting here. Well, it seems you kept yourself entertained. What was it all about? Did you meet Della Locke here? Oh, Miss Locke. Uh, well, we were uh, talking about question and answers about Jim. And this fellow here, he didn't approve. Of what, Miss Locke? The questions or the answers? Only cowboys. Cowboys who shoot down giants and then talk back. You mean like Jim Quince, huh? Talk isn't going to help. Either fists. This town's rope crazy. Trial or no trial, there's going to be a hanging. You take my advice and get your friend out of jail. Now. Otherwise, I go shopping for a wreath. That's what I like about the people in this town. Really helpful. Uh-oh. Things can get worse before they get better. They're gonna learn when I give an order. I mean it. What are you doing here? I gave orders for everybody to stay with the herd. You did? Why didn't somebody tell me? Well, anyway, I had to come into town to get a little odds and ends, you know, salt, like that. A needle and thread, too, Mr. Wishbone. I guess I just clean forgot what you said. We thought you might need some help. Thought, you fathead! You need a brain to think! The only thing you can do to help is get out of sight. One look at you in this town is gonna figure you're here to dismantle that jail board by board. Now, turn those horses around. Too late. Yeah, they're headed for the jail. Spread the word. Come with me, George. Some of you men come with me. Climb down, quick. If I can't keep Jim alive with talk, then I'll have to do it your way, the hard way. Them. 
I'll tell you one thing. If Faber doesn't come out of here pretty soon, I'm going to go in after it. You've done enough busting in where you don't belong. Let him settle this. Oh, Joe, talk won't settle anything. Don't get anybody shot, either. Yeah. Sit that crowd off, and that herd of ours is going to have to find Denver by itself. straighten you out, Roy. Well, just like you figured. Them drovers are all over that jail. Not for long, they ain't. Roy, it doesn't make sense to finish a fight that hasn't even started. It started. And that drover put a bullet in the Major's back. And it won't be finished until he's stressed out that rope that I strung up for him. We have a courthouse, a judge coming tomorrow. Let Devlin handle it. Devlin? <laughs> Devlin. Devlin couldn't handle a hot Sunday afternoon. You know that, Della. Maybe you do. Maybe you want those cowboy galaheads to walk out of this. I didn't say that. It's all settled, boys. Uh, just a little misunderstanding. Uh, the drovers ain't gonna start anything, so you can all go home. We ain't leaving till they do. They ain't in time for nothing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, oh, wait a minute. Uh, please listen to me. The drover's gonna be tried tomorrow just according to law. Whether you like it or not, uh, these people have a right to be here. Now, we just had it all out, and Mr. Kreider here is a witness. No matter what the jury says tomorrow, the drovers ain't gonna interfere. They ain't waiting for no jury. No, they wanna bust them out right now. No, no, uh, the trail boss gave me his word. You believe him? Come on, Devlin. You forget so soon? Major Courtney was murdered. He was shot in the back by a drover. Are you going to take a drover's word for anything? Now, Roy, you've got to listen. I say he's lying. He wants to bust his man out, and he's stalling until his whole crew gets here. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we don't need no trial. We know who did it. And I say turn him over. Right now. Hold oh, him. Ganger said I was lying. I'm ready to prove that he's wrong. Take off your guns. We won't ask for him back until the trial's over. Got anything more to say, Kane? He's bluffing. We're just here to help a friend, same as you'd do for a neighbor. But it's up to the law what happens to him. Not you, not us. Shooting it out ain't gonna make him any more innocent or any more guilty. And it'll cost us all a lot more than we can afford to pay. Seems to me the man's got a point. If they were going to tear down that jail, they wouldn't be standing there talking. Uh, I, I still say it's a trick. Well, it's no trick to take off some guns. Drover or no drover, I'd say that the man makes sense. Uh, the drovers can't do anything without these. Uh, so please, please go on home. You'll all have your say in the trial tomorrow. If there is a trial. Ella. Thanks for the good words. Thanks? For what? Postponing the inevitable? Your friend's like a rabbit caught in a bear trap, Mr. Favor be a lot kinder to put him out of his misery now, while you still have a chance. She's right. This didn't settle anything. They're going to come back, and when they do... You know, it's really comforting knowing the law is on your side. Looks like we got one good friend. It's gonna take proof to get Jim out of this. Not friends. Stay here and you better not start anything. What are you gonna do? And see what I can do to put Jim out of his misery while I still can.
expect to find back here? Can't do much worse than we have so far. According to the sheriff, this is where Major Gordon's body was found. Well, that's the loot. Yeah, the livery stable. How is it that is? That's funny. That's funny. Everybody's been so worried about Quince coming out. Nobody's bothered to ask what Major Courtney's body was doing back here. Was the Major still in there when you left last night? Yeah, him, among somebody else. Well, it's likely, then, that he came out this way. Come on. I'm in a hurry. You leaving? Just a short trip. Yeah, looks like kind of an expensive trip, isn't it? Well, I always travel first class, Mr. Yates. You traveling or are you running? From what? The trial tomorrow. I'm not interested in the trial. That makes you about the only person in town who ain't. Well, some people are interested in trouble, and I'm not. Well, how come you took our side this afternoon? What do you really know about Major Courtney's death? Nothing. The Major left here last night. Did he always go out the back door, or was that just last night? Who told you that? Nobody. Just wondering why his body was found out in the alley. Now, he'd go down there and get himself bushwhacked. Or he'd go down there to meet someone, the person who killed him. Well, in either case, you're a drover. How would Quince know that the Major was going out that way, or even that there was a back way? I can't see the Major going down there to meet someone he'd just had a fight with. Figured to be someone he knew. Well, that's not going to get you far, Mr. Favor. He knew almost everyone. And they all loved him. There's another possibility. I still haven't found anyone who heard that shot. I just suppose his body had been dumped out there after he'd been killed somewhere else. In the paradise, I presume. But where else? <laughs> well, now that's very clever, Mr. Favor. Your drover has no defense, so you'll simply attack without proof of anything. Well, this town doesn't have any proof, just a lot of talk, a lot of smoke. So it looks like I'm gonna have to raise a little smoke myself. By accusing me? Or do you have somebody else in mind? Kane was in the saloon last night. So were four or five other men. Let's get this straight. I don't care who killed your major or why. I just want to show that Quince didn't do it. Good luck. Oh, you're gonna help me. Oh, just like that? You're a drifter. You come into this town, you throw a couple of dollars on the bar, and then you're off again. This town keeps me in business. How many people do you think would come in here if I helped you? How many customers add up to a man's life? How many add up to mine? Come here, I want to show you something. You see that blonde sitting at the table? It's still a lock, the way she was a few years ago. But the same kind of customers. Oh, there were hundreds of them. With trail dust on their hands and in their minds. But they bought me this, Mr. Favor. This office. With the walls to keep them out. Now, do you want me to give that up now? Can't hide in here forever, Della. And when you do go out, you're gonna have to go past that gallows tree. How are you gonna feel then? I think we've run out of conversation, Mr. Favor. I swear you're afraid, Della. Of what? Is it that you know somebody who had a reason to kill the Major? How many times do I have to tell you that no one had a reason to kill the Major? In this town, he was known as the 13th Apostle. My, my, my. Kind of a friendly Apostle, too. Oh, dear, you give me that! No, I realize it ain't polite, but uh, neither's a hanging. Well, 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 it seems like you and the Major had more than just a passing acquaintance, I'd say. The respectable town hero running for governor and the lady saloon keeper. Wonder how many people know of the connection. There isn't any connection. That picture was taken many years ago. Yeah, but you still have it. And you're living here in Cottonwood, and so did the Major. That doesn't mean a thing, I tell you. Don't tell me. Let's go tell the sheriff. The sheriff? If you don't want to answer to me, maybe you'll answer to the law. There isn't anything to answer. Whatever you say to the sheriff, I'll deny. And I'm pretty sure that he'll take my side against yours. Well, let's just go make sure, huh? Just what are you trying to prove? I dirt you were talking about, Della. I'd like to find out how much of it stuck. Now, do you want to walk over there? Or do you want to be taken over there? Because either way, you're going to go. Uh, 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 we'll go out the 
the back way and it's quieter. Taking her to jail. You got any answers? No. Just quick. Maybe the sheriff can help us with the answers. All righty. You stay here. If Gain shows up. Don't worry. I'll let you know. Well, that ties it. Double just played pick up the posy for the last time with them drovers. Corey, get quieter. Now listen, Pete. I want you to start talking around town. Make it good now. We'll make sure there won't be no trial tomorrow this time. Bill, Josh. Hold on, what does that got to do with Della? You know, it's a funny thing about wild animals. You close in on them, they seem to forget everything nature gave them. Reminded of a doe I come across once. Miss Grizzly had her boxed up in a blind canyon. All that doe had to do to get away was backtrack. Instead, when she saw me, she tried to make a run for it. Made it real easy for that grizzly. Mr. Favor, in Cottonwood, we have our share of wolves, but grizzlies we haven't got. Then what are you afraid of? Will somebody please talk some sense around here? She was getting ready to run for it. I, I told want to know you, why. I don't like trials or lynchings. Especially if they're of an innocent man. Mr. Favor. Hey, you don't want to talk to me. Let's go talk to him. Uh, oh, now, you wait a minute. Stay out of this. I thought that was you, boss. Look, did you get anything? Anything at all? I don't know you, Jim. This is Miss Della Luck. Ma'am? Jim, she was at the saloon last night. I'm sorry, ma'am. I must have been worse off than I thought not to remember you. Well, say, maybe you can tell them. About the fight, I mean. It never was like they said. I never knew this Major Courtney. Well, I never was going to kill him. You can tell them that, can't you? What's wrong, Mr. Faber? If she was there, she should know. Yeah, she should know. Take it easy, Jim. I'll do everything I can. Yeah, just a drifter. Dumb cowpoke who eats dust all day long, sleeps in his clothes at night. When he does get a little time off, he heads for the bright lights of the nearest town. Now, nobody important like your major. Can't begin to compare. Except he wants to live, too, just like the major. Still want to put him out of his misery? Leave me alone. No. Take a good look. How does it feel to have the say-so over whether a man lives or dies? I don't! I don't! What are you trying to do, Mr. Favor? Same thing you're trying to do. Stop a lynching. They're coming, Mr. Favor, the whole town. If you've got anything to say, Della, now is the time to say it. There's nothing to say. Let's go. They can't stop them bare-handed. It's not up to us, is it, Sheriff? Well, how can I stop them? They won't listen. Well, make them listen. No talk this time, Devlin. Give us a drove or we'll walk right over you. The prisoner's your friend. Here, you talk to him. I don't want any part of him. All right, inside, everybody. Come on. I'm with you now. Mushy, you take the back. Here. Mushy. Which bone you stay with Jim? Clay, Rowdy, you take the front. Come on. We can't hold him back. We sure gonna try. Favor, no more stalling. No more promises. We want the Dover. 
Uh, and you just come on and get him, huh? Better think about it, though, Kane. You might get your lynching, but the price is going to be pretty high. That's the way you want it. You'd better have your men for the rifles out. I'm going to count three. One. Two. Wait! Paper stakes, Mr. Favor. Winner take all. Congratulations. You said all you're going to say, Dollar. I stay out of this. Why, Roy? So somebody else can die? Get out of the way, Dollar. Not until it's said. All of it. I'm telling you. Not telling me. Not anymore. Forget it, Roy. You'll never be another Major Courtney. Not even you could sink that low. The lady's got something to say. You're all going to listen. You can't talk about the Major that way. I can talk about him any way I want. I was his wife. Oh, you didn't know that, did you? You fools. You're waving your torches, carrying your rifles, and for what? Major Almighty Courtney was a lie. A paper idol on a pedestal of dead minds and broken dreams. That big, beautiful town hall, his gift to you. Oh, and you paid for it. Each one of you, over his crooked tables at the Paradise. He bought your respect. Just like he bought every one of us. And the beauty of the rotten little fairy tale was is that he made us like it. He made us beg to genuflect at his altar. Why are you listening to all this? Because you can't stop it, Roy. Any more than you can stop being what he always wanted you to be. A rug for him to walk on. A disciple to hold him up as he walked across the water. You said enough. Well, now what's the matter, Sheriff? Am I getting too close? Why do you think that he pinned this badge on you? Because he thought that you were going to uphold the law? Oh, no. He put it on because he wanted a coward to bend the law his way. Just as he wanted a thief like Kreider to run the bank on his terms. And a man with fists and no brain like Cain to build his ranch out of the broken bones of little people too weak to fight back. But most of all, he needed me. The audience of one that he had to have in his theater of lies. Oh, I knew. I knew from the beginning. But I ran his saloon. I cheated his customers. And I laughed at his jokes. Because that's what I was. I was his saloon woman. Not good enough to to wear his name, but good enough to wear his cheap jewelry. Because of him, something died in each one of us. And what was dead was hope. Hope. I understood that last night. For the first time when he told me that we were through. That cowboy didn't kill him. I did. I only wish he could have shot back. Well, you want a lynching, don't you? What are you waiting for? Come on. I pulled your idol down. Now, why don't you string me up? Go on, devil, and put on the badge. Put it on and make the law really mean something. Badge is just a piece of tin, Della. You'll have to answer the man behind it. Not me. Poor Ben. It's like a puppy who's lost his leash. Mr. Favor, you think some of the uh, dirt rubbed off? Whatever there was, Della, you sure cleaned it up.
Come on, Mr. Favor. I can't close up this box till I get that cup. Mm. Well, we're all set to roll, boss. Hello, Jim. Good to have you back. Mr. Favor, you don't know how good it is to be back. Jim, uh... Yeah, me and some of the boys are going to ride into Red Rock tonight. Maybe lift a few beers and things. Interested? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Ruddy. Uh, Wishbone and I found a new way to pass away the time. Oh, yeah, you did. What's that? Needlework. Hey, come on. We're in a hurry. Get the wagon rolling. Come on, Mushy. Close it up. Hey! I'm afraid I can't help you with the cloud. But you might find a harp inside. Six dollars? That's right. S-I-X. It's between five and seven. I'll even count it. Over my dead body, you'll count it. I just came in to get a few little odds and ends. I didn't come in to buy out your whole town. A few odds and ends. You've got 20 pounds of flour. You've got eight pounds of sugar. You've got one big bottom pot, which is right out of a drummer's dream. And you've got a three-pound skeleton. Now, do you call that just a few odds and ends? No more than a dab. I'm going to do all of my major shopping up in the next town. Mister, if you don't put six iron men in this little pinky, you ain't going to move out of... Good afternoon, Miss Abigail. Good afternoon. Is there anything I can do for you? Well, perhaps you should finish with this gentleman first. Oh, no, ma'am. You go right ahead. Sweet. It's just about that material I ordered. Yes, ma'am. I have it right here. Thank you, Mr. Hadleybird. If you will just put that on my bill. Sweet. Such a little girl. That's a mighty big package. For such a big boy, that's a mighty tired try. Sorry, man. Well, for such a little girl, that's a mighty big package. See what I mean? What did I do? Oh, there goes a dream with feet. Jezebel had feet, too. Prettiest thing this side of Hallelujah. that will be six dollars. Who's she? Miss Abigail? Yeah. About the best thing that ever happened to this town. She owns the Silver Slipper Salon. Salon? Well, really, it's saloon, but she doesn't like the sound of the word. She says it ain't elegant. Oh, no doubt about it. You know, uh, I wish this wagon load is kind of dry work. Especially on a hot day. I wonder uh, if this uh, salon, uh, they have drinks here? High, short, just plain wet, you name it, they've got it. <laughs> yeah, I could uh, go for a little something to settle my gastric acidity. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what about the rest of your supplies? Well, you load them. I'm thirsty. Mr. 
This is what a salon looks like. I'll still take a saloon. Man can't even hiccup in a place like this. You gents read? You can hang them on them pegs. Round here, guns just ain't refined. Well, we wouldn't want anybody thinking we weren't refined. Oh, my, no. We might give this salon a bad name. Well, absolutely. You point, I'll pour. That brown stuff looks mighty good. I'll take it by three fingers. You take sarsaparilla, not very much of that. Uh, as for me, I think about two fat fingers of that tall one there. Wish? When I am dead, my dearest. Something wrong? Who was that in that picture? Well, it's Captain Favorite, just like it says. Must have been a fine man. Died a hero. He died. Lookout Mountain. Story goes he got his whole company out before he went down. Miss Abigail just can't stop pining for that man. And Miss Abigail is his widow. Widow. Real shame. Pretty woman like that, just pining away for a man eight years dead. It's a real shame. Eight years dead. A real shame. I need some of that brown stuff. Make it three. Make it six. All right, let's take it from the beginning. Got the supplies? Nobody got shot. It's good. Nobody's in jail. Nobody even got drunk. Hmm? Right? Right. No trouble. No trouble, no. <laughs> What's the matter? Now, mind you squirming around like you're ready to hatch a keg of gunpowder. Yeah, well, uh, it's possible. And you with two nearly full-grown daughters. Mr. Favor just isn't like you. What just isn't like me? Well, if you'd have just told us all about it, it'd have been no problem. Maybe we could have uh, even helped out a little bit. She's such a pretty thing, too. Now, come on, there's no use denying it. We've been together too long. But I guess things like this happen even to the best of us. Yeah, if you'd rather have me take care of it, I'll handle it for you. What's it all about? Your widow. My... What? He means your wife. Uh, Miss Abigail. The poor little thing. Yeah. But, boss, the way you handled it, did you have to tell her you were dead? I am not dead. I ain't got no widow. My wife died during the war, and you all know that. So whatever you heard in that town, or saw, or thought, be it animal, vegetable, or mineral, is either a big mistake or a flat-out lie. Now, Mr. Favor, pictures don't lie, and yours is standing there on her bar just as big as life and twice as true. Well, I can see good sense ain't gonna settle this. I'll have to take care of it myself. Where is this uh, supposed widow of mine? I had a place called the Silver Slipper. It's a saloon. A saloon. Hold the hood till I get back. My widow of all the pea brain, simple-minded stories I ever heard. <laughs> uh, wait, look, uh, Jim, uh, you take over, will you? Make sure everything's all right. Well, where are you going? I don't think I'm gonna miss this, do you? <laughs> Wait for me. What about supper, Mr. Wishbar? At a time like this, who cares about food? I'm hungry. Like the saying goes, a picture's worth a thousand words. You do see the resemblance, don't you? Ain't no sad songs for me. Ugh. Here you are, gents. Liquid dynamite. Guaranteed to stir up. Up. Mm. 
You better leave the bottle. I think he's found a friend. Oh, sure, gents, sure. <laughs> it's, on, uh, it's on the house. It's got to be a mistake. Well, here, try a little of this. It might scare it away. All right, all right. The picture is legitimate. I, I even remember it was taken in Nashville at, at a wedding. Uh, well, it wasn't my wedding. Look, there's got to be a simple explanation. Yeah, just a simple little case of mistaken identity. Captain Favor? You see something green, boy? Wrong color. Ghosts wear white. It's... it's him. Back from the grave. Now, look! Is there something I can do? I'm sure that whatever this is all about is simply a misunderstanding. Abraham tells me that there seems to be a cattleman here who has some kind of a problem. It's been a long time, Abby. Gil? Sure isn't any case of mistaken identity. It, it can't be. It can't. Well, don't just stand there. No, no. You, you wanted to handle this all by yourself. Uh, you, uh, her room, I mean your wife's room, is at the top of the stairs, Captain Favor. Uh, thanks. Whisk! Sing no sad songs for me, Captain. You know, that's a real nice epitaph. Why, it's just like something out of one of them fairy tales. Just like he came back from the dead. Well, Mr. Favor called an awful lot of things, but... Prince Charming and Spirit aren't two of them. Yeah, well, by the time he and his widow finish up there, he'll have to add a few more names to his list. You're gonna need it. It really is you. Oh, yeah. And alive and not your dearly departed. It's you. Come on. I have a feeling I'm going to need a clear head more than I'm going to need that. I'll settle for a clear memory. Well, where shall we start? How about downstairs? Come on, let's go. Oh, oh no, Gil, I... I still feel a little faint. Well, then you better get used to it, Abby. Because by the time you finish explaining how come you're using my name without benefit of clergy, I've got a hunch you're gonna feel a lot fainter. No, Gil, please. Now, look, what do you want me to do? Go down there and tell him I was killed in a battle that I never even saw? That Dan was the best man and I was the groom in that picture taken downstairs? No, no, no more lies. I promise. J just hear me out, and, and then you can do whatever you have to do. No, oh, I'm an idiot. But all right. Well, let's start with that picture downstairs. Last time I saw it, Dan was standing alongside me. Lieutenant Daniel Beaumont Fletcher. The pride of Virginia. He was the most decorated man in his regiment. Oh, well, Dan was a good soldier. He was a little boy, Gil. All dressed up in gold and gray, with a white horse to ride and a silver saber to rattle. But without all those things, without the flags and the bugles and the glory, he was lost. 
helpless. So you cut him out of the picture? Not until I had cut him out of my life. After the war, there wasn't anything left in Virginia for Dan. We came west to start from scratch. Only Dan's education had somehow skipped over that word. There was no root or hog for Daniel Beaumont Fletcher. For him, everything had to start neck high with champagne to wash it down. One big idea after another came tumbling down until... Well, you might say I, I made an interesting saloon hostess. At least it kept one of us out of jail. He tried to hold up a store. Then he killed a man. Only it wasn't a man. It was a boy. They didn't bother with a trial. I was lucky. They only used preheated axle grease and secondhand straw on me. Abby. I washed all the grease off. But it took me over a year. A lifetime at the bottom of a dozen wells to learn that no amount of soap would ever take the stench out of the one and only thing Dan had left me. His name. So you launched the good ship Favor. It was either that or to learn to live with mud for the rest of my life. Oh, Gil, don't you see? Your name gave me a one-way ticket back into the human race. It gave me respectability. The legend of the war hero who never existed? That was the frosting on the cake. It gave me the halo to wear with my widow's weeds. And also made me owner of this place six months after I walked through the front door. With two dollars in my purse. And to live with a lie. I tried living with the truth, Gil. I have the scars that prove it. Oh, I know, I know. A, a sin has many tools and a lie is the handle that fits them all. But, but what was my sin? Creating a war hero eight years dead that still lives in his widow's heart? Was it wrong for me to let this town put me on a pedestal and call me Miss Abigail instead of... You gave me all this, Gil. Please don't take it away. unless it's a celebration or a funeral. You don't think that Mr. Fair would... What do you mean? Shoot a woman just for passing herself off as his widow? I guess. Uh, unless she was his widow. Yeah. Ain't no doubt about it. Captain Faber right down to his boots. I should know, I've been looking at his picture long enough. Oh, that man's been dead and buried for nine years come next month. Jebediah, there's always them that's got reasons for disappearing, especially cavalry officers. Like old Stonewall used to say, all flash and no cash. <laughs> Roddy, I'm getting worried. Don't you think we ought to go up there? <laughs> yeah, we do, and probably come down a lot faster than we went up. Depends on how many of us go up.
Who's the boss? Busy, and that's what you're supposed to be. Who's mine in the herd? Oh, well, the Nighthawks are still on out there. Yeah, right. but who's in charge? Well, well, Clay will be back in a little bit. Mushy's there. Oh, Mushy. It was because of Senor Fever. Well, we didn't know what to think. Yeah. Well, I have to admit, it ain't often he comes up with a widow. Well, one of you please tell us what's going on. Well, whatever's going on is going on up there behind that door. Been up there for the better part of an hour. Oh, that poor little old thing. By now, Mr. Faber's probably got her cut down to toothpick size. I don't know. Pretty face can tone the bark out of most any man. You don't think that Mr. Faber would... Ah, oh, no. Not Senor Faber. Never can tell. The sun is peeking out over the mountain. It's shining in a special way On this, our wedding day The mission bells will ring Down in the valley To tell the world That you are mine, my love As we say I do Bless us, Padre For our whole life through And as the sun goes down Over that mountain The stars will light our trail tonight as we ride home tonight In all the west I'll be The happiest trail boss <laughs> For on this day You gave me I am. I'm sure I don't have to tell you who this is. It really is Captain Faith. Where's he been all these years? I um, know this must come as a big surprise to you all, but there really is a simple explanation. You see, I was uh, wounded at the Battle of Lookout Mountain in the war, a, a head injury. Well, afterwards, they, uh, they called it amnesia. Amnesia? Yeah, well, that's the term that they use for a temporary loss of memory. You see, it's like a door closed up here on a few yesterdays. And it wasn't until I walked in here and actually saw Abby, I mean, Abigail, that, well, the door opened again, and I remembered the most important day of my life. I know you'll all understand what this means to me, finding a lovely wife that I never even knew I had after all these years. I know you're going to help us celebrate, too, so drinks on the house and keep those doors swinging wide. <laughs> Look, Mr. Faber. Later, Sonny, later. I'm busy. Sonny? Yeah.
Just drink up. It's on the house. I ain't thirsty. Sore heads. You're the ramrod. Do something. I will, as soon as I can think of something to do. Isn't that awful? First sight I've ever seen. children in two counties. <laughs> oh, Gil, this is Thelma and Jebediah Haddleburg. How do you do? You know, you might say Mr. Haddleburg is the leading citizen of Calvin. Well, thanks to you, Miss Abigail. I mean, <laughs> Mrs. Faber. <laughs> now, the way she's got this liquid gold mine running, there just ain't much business left for the rest of it. Of course, now, if you would uh, change your mind and sell me an interest in the silver slipper. Dame Fortune is a fickle gypsy, Jebediah. That's why I made a rule to always spin the wheel alone. Not anymore, dearie. You've got the captain to do your thinking for you now. <laughs> Mrs. Adelbird, to everything there is a season, to every purpose a time. I'm quite sure that when the right time comes for me to do the thinking for both of us, we'll know. Flower of the broom, take love away, and our earth is a tomb. <laughs> oh, if only you could be a dashing cavalry officer. And ride a white charger. <laughs> no, I ain't got the soul for it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Favor. Oh, Ronnie, see, it's about time you got acquainted with Mrs. Favor. Darling, this is Rowdy Yates. Amen, and pass the plate. Well, you know, it may not sound like a harp, but at least it's loud. Shall we? Mrs. Hedelbert, I uh, hope you won't think me too rude if I borrow your husband for a little talk. Oh, not at all, Captain. I'll even buy it. Well, we got to do something. I tell you, we just can't sit here and let her pick us off one by one. Yeah, we got to stick together. We got to get Rowdy out of there if we have to pull him by the heels. Now, remember, don't any of you let her sweet talk you. Because between a woman's yes and a woman's no, there isn't even room for a pin to go. Gentlemen, this is a celebration, not a funeral. Well, that, madam, is all in how you look at it. Come on, Rowdy, we got some answers to get. Yeah, all right. Uh, you'll excuse us? Do I have a choice? Miss Ave, uh, Mrs. Favor, if you would give me the pleasure. I've made it a rule of my life, Mr. Amy, to make business a pleasure, and pleasure is my business. <laughs> Good. Then it's settled. Captain, if you can get Miss Abigail, Miss Favor's name on a deed, you've got yourself the fastest deal ever made. Since when does a husband need a wife to close a deal? Now you just draw up those papers. I'll take care of Mrs. Favor. 
Captain, I'll be back as soon as I can. Mr. Baver, I think this is going just about far enough. Well, we think it's high time you told these people that there's some kind of mistake. Mistake? <laughs> Since when is finding a lovely wife a mistake? But, but uh, like you said, wish. Pictures don't lie, and there's mine, big as life, twice as true. Yeah, but what about the herd? Yeah, but look, boss, you got responsibilities. Jim, I figure my responsibility comes to my wife, first of all. I'm afraid you're gonna have to take over the herd, Rowdy. You see, Mrs. Favor and I, well, we're planning on having a little honeymoon to make up for the one we never had. But, Mr. Favor, you, you just can't leave us. Would you have me do, Joe? Make my wife a widow? Ah. Oh. I'm sorry, fellas. Uh, you're gonna have to take it from here. Well, I guess you've made that pretty clear. Yeah. Lots of luck, Mr. Favor. turn up more often. <laughs> oh, if you need anything, dearie, you just holler. Thank you. <laughs> I'd ever think anything so romantic would happen in a dust spot like Calvin. <laughs> Good, night. Good night. One more handshake. I might as well run for office. <laughs> he who has a thousand friends has not one friend to spare. <laughs> right now, I'd settle for the same number of enemies. Be a lot easier on the feet. Let it go, boys. We'll clean up in the morning. I'll lock up. Sure thing, Captain. After eight years, you two need me around like a hen needs teeth. <laughs> As the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. Oh, Gil, they believed it. Even your fantastic amnesia fabrication. My compliments to you, sir. Your charm was exceeded only by your performance. Uh, with a leading lady like you, how could I miss? Yeah, well, the curtain just went down, Gil, remember? Oh, not as far as Kelvin is concerned. This town has till death do us part written all over it. Well, um, it's been a long day. I, uh... Oh, yes, it certainly has. <clears throat> Well, of course, you'll be wanting to stay with your men. Leave you, darling? Why, what would your friends think? Then you'll be staying here. Dearest, where else? Uh, where else? <laughs> well, naturally, I... Uh... Well, I'll, I'll just get some bedding out for you. <laughs> Dead, my dearest. Sing no sad songs for me. <laughs> oh, oh my. Uh, now you startled me. Uh, well, I, I got a few things together, a few blankets and a spare pillow. I, I, I thought you might make yourself comfortable. Well, of course, I, I realize it. Too comfortable downstairs, I mean, with the drafts and everything. But I, I thought with a few blankets, you might find it comfortable. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure you can manage just fine without my help. <laughs> I don't 
know about this uh, sofa, Eddie. It's a little bit short. Maybe, uh... You wouldn't dare. You, you, you just try to come in here and you will be a dead war hero. You forget, Abby. You forget, Abby. I'm an officer and a gentleman. Well, then act like one. Sure you're safe, baby. Good night, darling. Night. You know, being your widow had its advantages. But it also had its drawbacks, too. One of them was this little ivory tower of mine. Could get pretty lonely at times. Well, what about you, Gil? What have you been doing since the war? Besides driving cattle, I mean. Gil? Well, that about rips it. You know, for a soldier and man, you've got a pretty lame deal. It takes two to make a deal, Mr. Heidelberg. I think it's a fair price for the silver slipper. It's what? Just what is the meaning of this? If you'll excuse me. Here's a board, son. Straighten it right out. Captain Faber, if you think that you can enter into any business transactions behind my back, I must tell you that your education has been sadly lacking in the ordinary first grade rudimentary application of common sense. I'll have you know that I have been managing my affairs very nicely, thank you, for some time now without your help. I'll just be a minute. Better they be. Ouch! And stop it! Gil, stop it! All right! All right, I'll listen! Ow. No, I'll listen. I promise. Just get this straight, because I'm only going to say it once. I only agreed to put on this uniform for one reason. To walk you out of a lie the same way you walked into it, with your eyes wide open, the yesterday's a closed book. But it has got to be my way. Now, either you go along with it, or we'll go downstairs right now and tell Mr. Hattlebird your right name. Well? Gil. You've got 10 seconds to think about it. One, two, three, four. Mr. Adelbert, I believe we were about to close a deal.
sweetheart. This is your honeymoon, not an execution. <laughs> All I wanted to say was, I, I can't thank you enough. Not only for taking care of my little bride for me, but for helping us start our new life together among friends. Isn't that right, dear? As old wood is best for burning, an old horse to ride, old books to read, so, too, old friends are the best to have. Now, we may not have known each other for very long, but... but to me, you'll always be old friends. Thanks. <laughs> Thumbed it out myself. You want to count it? Oh, remember, we're old friends. Boy, when you turn it on, it comes out better than cotton candy and Red River syrup. <laughs> <laughs> Ever you elect to go in politicking, you let me know. Will do. <laughs> Say goodbye to our friends, honey. Cotton candy and Red River syrup. <laughs> to get started. Yeah, I guess. Might as well pack up, Mushy. Shouldn't we wait a little longer, Mr. Wishbone? No, he ain't coming, Mushy. You better do as Wishbone says. We gotta get going. All right, everybody. We gotta get going. It's in your favor. Mr. Favor, yeah, we thought you were on your honeymoon. You said you were going to go on your honeymoon. Tell him. Abby. Right, all right. We were never married. I only used his name because mine ran out of blue ribbons. Well, but his picture. It was handy. You might call it a, a marriage of convenience by proxy. Marriage of convenience by proxy? Her husband was a friend of mine, taking his place as a war hero who never existed. It was the only way that I could get his widow out of Calvin with her reputation all in one piece. But, Captain... Uh, Mr. Favor, uh, how come you never told us about this? Well, it was the only way to ensure that your silence would be golden. For the silver slipper, $5,000 from Cupid and Mr. Haddleburg. I guess there really wasn't any other way, was there? There's a stage depot down the road a few miles. You'll be able to get a new start there. As marriages go, ours didn't last very long. But it had its points. Uh, Rowdy, uh, the lady needs a driver. Eight men and pass the plate. Ah, uh, just a minute on second thought. Toothless better do the honors. Sure a lot safer. Oh, yeah. I'll uh, 
Take this along, just in case you get any ideas again. I ain't never had no pictures took. Well? All right, come on, let's get this thing packed up. Mushy! Well, uh, shall I form the cattle into platoons, Captain? Or should we just charge them right into Denver? At ease, Private. At ease.